Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us for this event in the American Stories Inspiration Today series, and welcome to this talk by the spirited and insightful historian, Rick Beyer. All of us behind the scenes are delighted you're with us virtually in the land of books and American history in this transformational time. We're currently in a webinar format, which means you're all on mute and your videos will be off throughout this hour long program. You're now looking at a rundown for our hour together. After we do some quick introductions and scene setting, Rick Beyer will launch into his marvelous illustrated presentation about the intertwining lives and politics of Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. He will talk for about a half an hour. When he's done and the duel is over, we'll, at, we'll turn to your questions. For now, sit back and relax. Hi, welcome. I'm Kristen Lottie from the Boston Public Library. We're thrilled to be here this evening with Rick Beyer and Margaret from the New England Genealogical Historical Society. Um, before we begin, just a little bit about our guest this evening. Rick Beyer is a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning documentary filmmaker, and a longtime history enthusiast. His most recent book, Rivals Unto Death, is a vivid retelling of the Hamilton Burr rivalry. He has made films for PBS, the History Channel, A&E, and National Geographic. Rick Beyer has penned the popular Greatest Stories Never Told series of history books. Currently, he co-hosts the Facebook YouTube livecast, History Happy Hour, and he lives in Chicago. And now I'd like to welcome co-host Margaret back. Um, Margaret from the New England Historic Genealogical Society, welcome. Hi, I'm Margaret Talkett. I'm a director at American Ancestors New England Historic Genealogical Society, and I'm the curator of American Inspiration, our in-person author series. It's great to be partnering with the Boston Public Library, and I know you'll enjoy hearing from Rick Beyer. As my colleagues and I were saying today, it's a bit of an early celebration of July 4th. Um, as many of you know, Alexander Hamilton's support of General George Washington was so important during the American Revolution. It's also a commemoration of the duel itself. On July 11, it'll be 216 years since Burr and Hamilton walked paces and drew pistols. And well, with Disney Plus soon coming out with Hamilton, this event had to be done and we all really did need some education on that front. Uh, there are many issues to discuss today related to these two men and the time they lived in. You've been asking questions. Some of you registered over Zoom and you asked there. If you didn't get a chance to ask when you registered, then you can send in a question anytime during this event using the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. If you're joining us over YouTube, use the chat feature. So fire away and we'll get to as many of these questions as we can later with Rick after his presentation. Um, with that, Rick, if you're there, now is the time to take us back to 1804 and before that to colonial America in those heated days of the American Revolution. Take it from here, Rick. Thank you very much, uh, Kristen and Margaret, and welcome everybody to the Zoom where it's happening. And bear with me for a moment while I share my screen to get the appropriate visual presentation. And there I think we go. And so, um, almost, there we go. So, let us begin. Wednesday, July 11th, 1804, Aaron Burr stood on a clearing below the cliffs of Weehawken, New Jersey, holding a pistol just so. 30 feet away stood Alexander Hamilton holding an identical pistol. The same two pistols had been used in the exact same spot three years earlier in a duel that killed Hamilton's son. On this day, Burr thought he read fear in Hamilton's eyes. He looked like a convicted felon, Burr said later. Finally, when everyone was ready, Alexander Hamilton's second, Nathaniel Pendleton, shouted, present. What transpired next and in exactly what order was bitterly contested by those present and has been argued about for two centuries since. What we know for certain is this. Aaron Burr pointed his Wagden dueling pistol at Alexander Hamilton 
and pull the trigger. A 50 caliber ball left the muzzle at a speed of 545 miles per hour, traversed the distance between the two men in less than a 20th of a second, pierced Hamilton's abdomen, struck a rib, ricocheted into his liver and mortally wounded him. And there it is. I've done it. I have given away the ending of my book, not to mention a major Broadway show. This is a murder mystery in which there's no mystery at all about who pulled the trigger. We know that Aaron Burr shot Alexander Hamilton. The mystery is in the why. The mystery is in the hearts of these two men. Consider this, just one week before, they sat side by side at a gala July 4th dinner at Francis Tavern in New York City. And the drink was flowing and there were toasts and there were jests. And there they were, the sitting vice president of the United States and the former secretary of the treasury. To all observers seeming as if they were enjoying the evening and yet having already set in motion their deadly plan to meet on the dueling ground. So how can that be? How can you sit side by side with someone calmly and yet be so filled with rage that the only way to deal with it is to shoot it out? And this was, believe me, a seismic event in post-colonial America. To get an idea of the magnitude of this event, imagine that you wake up tomorrow morning and read on Facebook that Vice President Mike Pence and former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton had decided to settle their distances with guns blazing across the Potomac. It's a truly extraordinary chapter in our history involving two fascinating men. Now, as you know, and as was mentioned, uh, Lin-Manuel's amazing musical will be streaming on Disney Plus starting next month. I've seen the trailer. I'm excited. Um, and um, a lot of people have asked me concerning the show, they say, well, how accurate is it? What is the verdict of history versus Hamilton? And I would say, first of all, that there is a whole lot of history packed into this show, probably more history per square inch than any Broadway show ever. But it's a show. So sure, there's stuff that's made up and there's stuff that's left out, which is why you need to check out the real story. And among the things that are left out are the fact that Aaron Burr fought a duel with Alexander Hamilton's brother-in-law, or the fact that Aaron Burr saved Alexander Hamilton's life twice. Okay, so there's a lot that's not in there. But the wonderful thing about the show is that it has really inspired a desire to know the real story. And that's exactly what led to this book. My goal was to bring to vivid life the most important elements of the story. And I had two other thoughts in mind as well. Number one, I wanted to take the founding fathers off the pedestal. When we think of our founding fathers, we conjure up an image, something like this painting by John Trumbull. And it's very solemn and dignified men doing something very important for America. And true as that might be of the subject of this painting, it also does an incredible disservice to history because these guys were not statues. They were flesh and blood and robing them in marble robs them of their humanity. They were a fractious bunch. They were filled with ambition and jealousy and ego and at times rage. And I wanted to portray them that way. Look, we don't often think about George Washington cursing a blue streak like he did at the Battle of Monmouth when one officer said he looked like a thunderclap before the lightning flash. And we don't think of Thomas Jefferson being a whiner, whining about the length of other people's speeches during cabinet meetings, Alexander Hamilton. And we don't think of the august figure of John Adams being filled with vulgar and caustic insults like when he said about Hamilton, he said Hamilton's behavior was very strange due to, and I am quoting a former president of the United States here, a superabundance of excretions which he could not find whores enough to draw off. Now look, we have a president today who says some provocative things via Twitter. I think that John Adams could give him a run for his money. The second thing I wanted to do was be objective. Look, Aaron Burr, history and popular culture have made him the villain of this tale. 
And that's pretty universal. And as one historian put it, um, history has tagged Aaron Burr as a scoundrel and history has it right. But I felt that I could not take that point of view in this book, that that wouldn't be appropriate, even though, as it happens, I am the historian who said this. So yeah, I came to this story with my own biases, but I decided I needed to set them aside and uh, look at Aaron Burr objectively. And it really opened new villas because Burr is a war hero in the revolution at the Battle of Quebec and elsewhere. He was an abolitionist. He was a supporter of immigrant rights, far more so than immigrant Alexander Hamilton. He was a patron of the arts. He was a loving husband and father and a brilliant innovator in political campaigning. So I felt that giving Aaron Burr his due was going to make for a better and more true story. Now this book really zeroes in on the interactions between these two. So let's talk about uh, their lives a little bit. Um, they're both orphans, but from very different backgrounds. Hamilton was born on the island of Nevis and grew up there and on St. Croix in unspeakable circumstances. His mother was not married to his father. They were very poor. His father ran off. His mother died when he was 13. Other calamitous things happened. And it was only through the strength of his own character and intellect that he survived, that he thrived actually, and was able to make it to the mainland, to New York when he was 18 to attend what is now Columbia University. Uh, Aaron Burr, also an orphan, but from very different circumstances. His grandfather was the great theologian, Jonathan Edwards. His father, also named Aaron Burr, was the president of what is now Princeton. Uh, Burr's parents died when he was a baby, but an uncle, a well-to-do uncle came in, uh, took care of him, raised him. He attended Princeton and graduated at age 16, which even though people graduated younger in those days, that was still unusually young. So you have two prodigies, two young men in a hurry, and their lives become intertwined during the revolution. They both volunteered. They were both commissioned as officers. Now we don't know for sure when they first met, but the first time that I can ascertain they are in the same place at the same time is September 15th, 1776, in the most desperate hour of the Battle of New York. Now, when I'm giving this presentation live, I usually look out at the audience and say, how many of you consider yourselves knowledgeable about the Battle of New York? And in most venues, somewhere between zero and one people will raise their hand. If we're in New York City, we'll get two people who will raise their hand. The Battle of New York is the biggest battle of the American Revolution. 35,000 British soldiers and sailors versus a ragtag army of 25,000 under George Washington. It starts with an amphibious landing on Brooklyn. It travels over to Manhattan. It goes up all the way to Harlem, into Westchester, over to New Jersey. It's the biggest battle in the revolution. Why is it not a part of our collective memory? And the reason is very simple and probably a lot of you have already figured it out. We lost. We were creamed in this battle. Washington lost at least three quarters of his army. So we choose to remember the Battle of Trenton, which is a much, much smaller battle, but it is a battle that Washington won. So anyway, where was I? Battle of New York, September 15th, 1776. The British land a force on Manhattan uh, around Kipps Bay, around where 34th Street is right now. And Washington tries to make a stand with the militia uh, around where the public library is in New York. See, we got a nice mention of the public library in there, even if it's a competing public library. Um, but the militia turn tail, they run up Broadway. They don't want any part of fighting the British. And Washington is disgusted and upset. He's on his charger. He takes his hat. He throws it on the ground. He says, good God, have I such troops as these? And then he orders a general withdrawal all the way up to Harlem. By late afternoon on that day, all of Washington troops have gone to Harlem, except for one contingent under Colonel Gold Silman, it's manning a fort near where Chinatown is now. And uh, Aaron Burr is a staff officer at this point. He realizes that Silliman is still there with his troops. He tells him, you should retreat and join Washington. 
No, says Silman, I'm going to, we're going to fight it out to the death here. He's very gung-ho. So then Burr plays a trick on him. He rides off. He rides back 10 minutes later. I have verbal orders from General Putnam. You must retreat now and retreat up to Harlem. And this time, Silman, well, he's going to obey the orders, even though those orders aren't real. And Burr leads him to safety up with the rest of Washington's troops. And why is that important? It's important because one of the soldiers under Colonel Silman was Alexander Hamilton, commanding an artillery battery. And if Aaron Burr had not played his little ruse and brought them up to Harlem, then probably Hamilton would have been killed or captured. And believe me, all the people, almost all the Americans captured in the Battle of New York ended up dying on prison ships. So that was arguably the first time that Aaron Burr saved Alexander Hamilton's life. Lin-Manuel Miranda didn't tell you about it, but you heard about it here. So Hamilton and Burr were each offered a chance to serve on George Washington's staff. Uh, Burr, when he was 20, during the Battle of New York, Hamilton a year later at age 22. Think about that for a moment, how young they were and being on the staff of the commanding general. But it's startling how different their experiences were under Washington. Burr lasted 10 days, left with a bitter taste in his mouth and a lifelong hatred of George Washington. And Alexander Hamilton lasted four years, became Washington's most important aide and his lifelong protege. And their opinions of Washington couldn't have been farther apart. Hamilton thought Washington was the greatest man who ever lived. Burr once said that he despised Washington as a man of no talents who couldn't speak a sentence of common English. And so this divide over Washington splits them in a number of different ways, one of which is politically. Hamilton is drawn towards the Federalist Party, advocating for a strong government that could support an army in the field. Burr gravitates towards the opposition party, known as the Democrat-Republican Party, sometimes simply called the Republican Party, very different from today's Republican Party. And so this divide over Washington plays a big role in the story of the relationship between Hamilton and Burr. Now, after the war in 1783, both of them start law practices in New York City, but it's a very different New York than we know today. About 15,000 people living there. And one of my favorite statistics, about a dozen lawyers in the entire city. I mean, before the virus hit, you could go into a Starbucks in Manhattan and see a dozen lawyers. But at that time, there's only about that many in all of New York. So if Hamilton and Burr are both lawyers there, of course they know each other well, and they're in each other's uh, uh, court cases, and they're socializing, and they are very connected. And they presented at this time a contrast in appearance. Uh, Burr was very careless about his clothing. He's nicely dressed in this painting uh, from a time when he's a little older, but generally observers saw him as being careless about his clothes. He would wear an old black coat. He wasn't very particular about the way he took care of his hair, sort of a, uh, an elegant nonchalance, if you will, to his style. Alexander Hamilton said smart clothes are essential and he believed it. He wore suits made by a French tailor and um, according to his son, he got his hair groomed every day. And don't we all wish that we could do that, especially in this time period. Um, they were also very different in court. So Hamilton was more combative, Burr more persuasive. Hamilton appealed to the head, Burr, it was said, enslaved the heart. Hamilton watched Burr in court one day and said that, he said he's concise, he's, he's pleasing, but he said, um, when I analyzed his arguments, I could never understand in what his greatness consisted. So we have these two young lawyers, two young men on the rise in this brand new country. Hamilton, of course, gets involved in writing the Federalist Papers, arguing uh, in, on behalf of the Constitution, and becomes Secretary of the Treasury. Burr becomes Attorney General of New York State, uh, and later a Senator from New York. And things are pulling them together, things are pulling them apart, it's sort of a normal political relationship. But when Hamilton explores a run for president, excuse me, 
when Burr explores a run for vice president in 1792, Hamilton doesn't just oppose him, he goes ballistic. Let me read you a quote about that from my book. This is Hamilton. His rage exploded onto the page in an extended rant he shared privately with his closest allies. Burr said Hamilton was unprincipled, both as a public and private man. He is for or against nothing, but as it suits his interest or ambition. He is determined, as I conceived, to make his way to be the head of the popular party and to climb to the highest honors of the state and as much higher as circumstances may permit. Burr, he said, was trying to play the game of confusion, and I feel it a religious duty to oppose his career. Now, this is 12 years before the duel, and Hamilton is al already saying he feels it a religious duty to oppose Burr. So what's going on here? Well, first of all, when Burr became the senator from New York, he displaced uh, the previous senator, who was Alexander Hamilton's father-in-law. So there's something personal here. But I think there's a lot more than that. Hamilton saw politics as a sacred mission. He had fixed principles, and he was going to use his position to argue for them as fervently as possible. And Burr saw politics as a career, like the law, an arena in which to do as well as he could. So when Hamilton looked at Burr, he saw a man basically only concerned with winning, only concerned with getting ahead. And to Hamilton, that was far more dangerous than someone who simply had opposing views. So from then on, they were implacable enemies until their duel 12 years later at Weehawken. Except no, not at all. Because one of the most fascinating parts of this story is that a few years later, they came tantalizingly close to becoming allies. And to talk about that, I want to fast forward to a scene in 1797 involving a dust up between Hamilton and another founding father, James Monroe. Let me take a drink and read you a little excerpt about this. I never realized how much Zoom could make you thirsty. On Tuesday morning, July 11th, 1797, Hamilton was trembling with rage. The target of his anger was future President James Monroe, who had just returned from Europe after being recalled as minister to France. When Hamilton accused Monroe of being a liar, the Virginian became equally incensed. The two men leapt out of their chairs and began screaming at each other. Do you say I represented falsely? You are a scoundrel, Monroe shouted. I will meet you like a gentleman, Hamilton fired back. I am ready. Get your pistols, said Monroe. <laughs> Anger management, people. The argument that took place that day, the subject of that argument, was America's first great sex scandal. Alexander Hamilton had an affair with a young married woman named Mariah Reynolds, and her husband, James Reynolds, started blackmailing Hamilton over this affair with the knowledge of, likely the consent of, his wife. A charming couple, the Reynolds, great footnote characters in American history. And we know all about this affair because Alexander Hamilton decided to write a 90-page treatise about it. Now, why did he do that? Well, he did that because uh, he wanted to show, look, I, I didn't pay James Reynolds because we were involved in some corruption scheme, like some people say. I only did it because he was blackmailing me over sleeping with his wife. This defense, as you can imagine, did not go over real well. I've heard it said that it's not the crime, it's the cover-up with Hamilton. I think it was the uh, crime, it was the cover-up that hurt him. And people uh, laughed at him. I mean, it really hurt him quite badly. And uh, one of his opponents said of this, that uh, Hamilton's defense seems to be, I am a rake and therefore I cannot be a swindler. But anyway, for reasons that I detail in the book, Hamilton blames Monroe for revealing his affair with Mariah Reynolds. and they, they, they have heated words, Hamilton storms out, and it looks like they're gonna fight a duel. So Monroe contacts somebody to be his second, you know, his representative in negotiating for a duel or trying to negotiate out of a duel. And the person he picks, of course, 
is Aaron Burr. And so Aaron Burr now starts to try to untangle things between Monroe and Hamilton, and he succeeds. It takes him almost a year, but he imagines to calm everybody down. He withholds some letters. He asks people to write other letters, and eventually he makes this whole thing go away. And Hamilton is very appreciative. And so Hamilton and Burr, well, there's a new rapprochement there. They're starting to be on committees together, acting kind of buddy-buddy. Hamilton tries to get Burr a job with a new army that's being formed, although George Washington says no, because um, he's going to be the head of that army. Uh, Hamilton even tells an observer, another person, that he says, I think, I think Burr is coming over in my direction. I think we're going to be on the same side very soon. So this rapprochement doesn't last long, but it's very interesting to realize that even um, along the way here, history could have veered off and gone in a different direction. Now, in the story of Hamilton and Burr, the election of 1800 looms really large. And uh, that's for a couple of reasons. One is that it takes place just four years uh, before the duel. Uh, another is that it sets Hamilton and Burr into opposition. They're not the main stars of the show in the election of 1800. They're the bit players who steal the parts, so who steal the limelight. So let me um, set the scene. The incumbent in this election is John Adams, who is brilliant and crotchety. And he and his Federalist Party, they are wielding the um, Alien and Sedition Acts as a club to try to crush opposition dissent. They are putting uh, congressmen and newspaper editors from the opposition party, the Democrat Republican Party, into jail. And uh, there's a lot of this going on and it's pretty nasty. Uh, and at times it's uh, almost amusing. Um, one of my favorite cases involves a couple of tipplers outside a tavern in Newark, New Jersey, who were amused by the spectacle of a 16 gun salute going off as the president's carriage went by. There goes the president and they are firing at his ass, bellowed Brown Clark. I don't care if they fire through his ass, responded his drinking companion, Luther Baldwin. Amusing enough, but both men went to prison and had hefty fines because of those remarks. So the Republicans believe that if Adams is elected, it's gonna be tyranny and one man rule and democracy is done for. And um, so they put up their own candidate, Thomas Jefferson, great champion of democracy. Well, the Federalists basically think that Jefferson is Satan, really not far from that. And they think that if Jefferson becomes president, it will, he's imbued with the spirit of the French Revolution, it'll be off with their head, mob rule, blood in the streets, and all sorts of horrors. Now, we're in the midst of a presidential election right now and tempers are high, and rhetoric is heated. And you might think that if we went back 220 years to the early days of our country, that we would find a more genteel language going on. And you couldn't be more wrong. And so to talk about that, I want to read one more excerpt here from the election of 1800. The fervent belief that so much was at stake Indeed, that the fate of the new nation might be in peril, fueled unparalleled personal attacks and deep-seated paranoia. President Adams was decried as a warmonger, a tyrant, a criminal. Republican editor James Callender mocked him as a poor old man and a hideous hermaphroditical character. Jefferson was labeled as an atheist and apocalyptic prophecies were made about a Jefferson presidency. Murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will all be openly taught and practiced, predicted the Connecticut Current, an actual real example of fake news. The air will be rent with the cries of distress, the soil will be soaked with blood, and the nation black with crimes. Reverend Thomas Dwight, the president of Yale, blustered that under a Jefferson presidency, we may see the Bible cast into the bonfire. We may see our wives and daughters, the victims of legal prostitution. Housewives in New England buried their Bibles in the garden, convinced that as president, Jefferson would confiscate and burn them. So if you're in a colonial era house there in Concord or Weymouth or someplace and you're gardening tomorrow, 
dig deep, keep an eye out for those Bibles. So let me fast forward to the end of this election. It ends in a tie. It ends in a tie, but the tie is not between Jefferson and Adams. The tie is between Jefferson and his vice presidential candidate, Aaron Burr. Because of a quirk in the constitution at that time, votes for president and vice president count the same amount. They each have 73 electoral votes, which means the election is going to have to be decided by the Congress. We've fixed that since then. But let me tell you, even in 1800, people were insanely upset with the electoral college. And so the Congress is going to have to decide. And the thing is that the Federalists, I told you, they think Jefferson is Satan. So they would much rather have Aaron Burr as a candidate. And Burr, realizing he's got a shot at the presidency, is kind of letting it be known privately that he's willing to be elected, willing to take the job. And so Congress, actually the House of Representatives, goes through 33 ballots deadlocked with tensions rising and people very upset about this all across the country. Now, virtually every Federalist is supporting Burr because they think, well, Burr, he's flexible. He's somebody we can work with. His principles, you know, he's willing to compromise on them, unlike Jefferson. There's one Federalist who is not favoring Aaron Burr. And I think you know who it is. It's Alexander Hamilton. Now, Hamilton is no friend of Jefferson's. They are mortal enemies. Four years earlier in the election of 1796, Hamilton said all personal and partial considerations must be discarded and everything must give way to the great object of excluding Jefferson. But that was four years ago, back in 96. This is 1800, times have changed. And so now Alexander Hamilton is saying, there is no doubt that upon every virtuous and prudent calculation, Jefferson is to be preferred. He is by far not so dangerous a man. Well, a lot of people aren't listening to Hamilton at this time. He's writing to all sorts of members of Congress and everybody he can think of trying to convince them that Burr is the worst possible choice in the world, that they will rue the day that they voted for him, that the country will go down the tubes with Burr as president. And he does make an impression, however, on one person, the congressman from Delaware, who changes his vote after 30 plus ballots uh, and decides to vote for Jefferson instead of Burr. And that changes the whole equation. Other people then change their votes. And on the last ballot, 33rd ballot, I think, Jefferson is elected president. Now, in, in going against Burr and in writing really lengthy diatribes about him to people, Hamilton was acting privately. This wasn't up on Facebook. It wasn't in a newspaper. It wasn't public. But I think Burr probably found out about it. I mean, it was juicy gossip. It's hard to hide. But Burr wasn't the kind of guy to, uh, to sort of strike back right away, to make a fiery speech. Uh, Hamilton was fire. Burr was ice. And uh, Burr's icy resolve was eventually to pursue, per, prove fatal to Alexander Hamilton once things piled up too far for Burr. And now with three years to go, they really were on a collision course for Weehawken. So let's fast forward one more time to the month that that duel took place, July 1804, and talk a little bit about what happened there. And you know, for such an important historical event, this duel has a ridiculous proximate cause. In March of 1804, a doctor in New York named Charles Cooper was at a dinner party that Hamilton was also at. And Cooper wrote a letter saying that he had heard Hamilton call Burr a dangerous man not to be trusted. Now, that's not a very nice thing to say, but those are not the words that led to this duel. Those are not the words that got Hamilton into trouble. In the same letter, Hamilton, uh, Cooper wrote, I could detail you a still more despicable opinion which General Hamilton has expressed of Mr. Burr. A still more despicable opinion. Those are the words that cause this duel. By accident or design, Cooper's letter gets printed in a newspaper. And a few months later, a couple of months later, Burr 
gets a copy of this newspaper and reads this letter. And Burr is in a very bad state of mind. He has been dumped from the vice presidential ticket. He's not going to be running for re-election with Jefferson. He's lost a vicious governor's race in New York. He has been slandered and terrible things have been written about him in the newspapers, including a newspaper uh, owned by uh, Alexander Hamilton that, uh, that is now we know as the New York Post. And uh, he is very angry. And so he writes to Hamilton and basically says, are you disparaging my character with these remarks? What was the still more despicable opinion? What did you say about me? And is it disparaging my honor? And at this point, Hamilton has an opportunity to say, wow, I have no idea what he's talking about. And I didn't say anything that I can even imagine fitting that description. And I'm, you know, he could back off. But what he does instead is he starts to taunt Burr a little bit. He gets legalistic. He writes in his response to Aaron Burr, "'Tis evident that the phrase, still more despicable, admits of infinite shades from very light to very dark. How am I to judge of the degree intended or how shall I annex any precise idea to language so indefinite?" So he's nitpicking about the wording and this drives Burr crazy. And what follows then is a series of letters back and forth and end up with this duel being fought on a Wednesday morning on July 11th. And that last three weeks before the duel is really fascinating. And so in the when I wrote the book, I kind of stretched out the timeline a little bit. I really tried to go day by day in that point to really give you the sense of this uh, descent into hell, right? This kind of almost inevitable uh, 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 rolling down the hill to get to the point of the duel. Okay, day of the duel, what happened? Who fired first? That is often a question that I get. There's four men present at the duel. There's five in this picture, but the picture's not quite accurate. Dr. Hosack was not on the scene. He was a few steps away so that he could, as the play says, preserve deniability. Uh, four people, one of them is mortally wounded in the course of the duel. And from the other three, we get two diametrically opposed accounts. Um, According to um, Nathaniel Pendleton, who was Alexander Hamilton's second, Burr fired first. Hamilton only fired when he was struck by the musket ball and he kind of fired as a reflex. No, 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 say Aaron Burr and his second, William Van Ness. Hamilton fired first. Burr waited a few seconds for the smoke to clear and only then fired. So that's the eyewitness testimony. You can parse it all you want, it's diametrically opposed. So what else can we look at? Well, there's a few other factors. I detailed them in the book. I'll talk about two here right now. One is what Hamilton said the night before. He told Pendleton, and he wrote in a letter to his wife, that he was going to throw away his shot. It pleases God to give me the opportunity to reserve and throw away my first fire, and I have thoughts even of reserving my second fire. So Hamilton has said, I'm not going to fire first. So that must mean Burr did, right? Except it's one thing to say that the night before, and it's another thing to be acting on that when you're 30 feet away from somebody else with a gun. And it's important to note that Hamilton never said that publicly. It was only something he wrote privately. The second factor I want to call the incident of the glasses. As they're getting ready to fight the duel and their Nathaniel Pendleton is about to shout present, um, Hamilton says, stop. And everybody looks at him, what's going on? And he says, well, in certain light, one requires glasses. And then he does this thing. He pulls his glasses out of his frock coat. He is now kind of, is it better with the glasses? Is it better without the glasses? And um, finally decides to use the glasses. Well, if you're Aaron Burr, what do you think about that? You obviously think that Alexander Hamilton is gunning for you. So maybe you will fire first, or if Hamilton fired first, maybe you'll be firing to kill because you don't wanna have to continue the duel and risk getting shot at again. Ultimately, in my opinion, there's a lot of, um, a lot of people have opinions about this. I don't think it's possible to know exactly what happened. What is interesting to me is what would have happened if the duel had never taken place. And John Adams thought about that too. And he said, what would have been the consequence? Shall I say that Hamilton would have been now alive 
and Hamilton and Burr now at the head of our affairs? What then? The president's sage hindsight is something to ponder. In the end though, both men were losers. Rage took the reins and ruin followed. The story of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr is a story that has it all. Violence, politics, jealousy, sex, and guys wearing wigs. It's both entertaining and vastly illuminating, both about our past and honestly about our present as well. It's been a great pleasure to distill it into this small and hopefully powerful package and to talk with you about it today. So now I'm going to hand it over back to Kristen and Margaret and the questions that people might have about my friends, Alex and Aaron. And I'm gonna stop my share. There we go. Are you guys there? We are. Um, I'll jump in. How about, um, Anne has a question. Will you also Hi, share what happened to Burr afterwards? So if you could give a little bit of post. Sure, post sure. Burr. Yes, uh, Burr's history is very interesting afterwards. Um, he, um, he first flees to, uh, flees New York. He's indicted in New York. He flees, uh, you know, it's gonna head down south until the heat dies down. Um, and then he eventually comes back to Washington. He presides over uh, an impeachment trial of a judge in which everybody says he does a bang up job. Um, and then after that, he gets involved in this very murky, most likely treasonous scheme to seemingly start a country out of the area that's now the middle of America, Ohio and, and the land beyond that. Um, and eventually uh, Thomas Jefferson, and remember he had served under Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson uh, orders Burr to be arrested for treason and he is charged with treason and he is tried for treason. And John Marshall, the chief justice of the Supreme Court presides at that trial, but John Marshall, he's a federalist. He thinks Thomas Jefferson is Satan. And so he gets Burr off on a technicality. Burr goes to England, hangs out in England for a while, eventually comes back, lives in New York, um, uh, marries uh, another time. Um, his wife eventually files for divorce. Um, he dies on the day that his, her divorce comes through. And her divorce lawyer was the son of Alexander Hamilton. Thank you. Um, I have another question about Aaron Burr. Um, I am, I've, it's, it's been gathered from your work that Aaron Burr was more of a feminist than, um, than Alexander Hamilton, that his wife Theodosia was more, edu was highly educated and, um, and that, that there, he was, you know, kind of a, his own form of woman's liver. And this is sort of the best thing I've heard about him. I mean, the lore and the legend on Alexander Hamilton is so terrible. I mean, on Aaron Burr is so terrible. So um, can you tell us about women's rights at the time and where Aaron Burr stood on that? It's not so much what he did as a public person, because I don't think there was a lot of effort publicly to try to get women the vote or, or allow them to have property rights and such. But he was very um, respectful of uh, women's intellect in a way that I think a lot of men were not at that period of time. He would read um, uh, books by uh, uh, prominent female authors, uh, discuss them in letters with his wife, uh, discuss them with his daughter. Um, you know, the author of uh, uh, Frankenstein, who she was a very, very much of a of a powerful advocate for women. And he thought a great deal of some of her writings on that. And so I don't know that it really comes out in his, in like what he's doing uh, as a Senator or as vice president. It's just that it stands in so marked contrast. I never hear of George Washington and Martha Washington, you know, sharing um, uh, sort of, um, uh, this kind of literature and discussing uh, women's rights that way in the way that Aaron Burr did with his wife and daughter. He was a big promoter of his daughter too. She died, unfortunately, fairly young. And I think um, after the duel, but, uh, but still fairly young. Thank you. We have they were both named, oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I was gonna say they're both named Theodosia, which makes uh, research challenging sometimes because there's two Theodosia Burrs and you have to make sure you know which one you're talking about. Ah, that's interesting. 
Um, James asks, how political do you consider Marshall's decision? So going back to what we were talking about just a moment ago, um, if you could just the technicality and about the treason, if you could speak to that just a little bit more and specifically about the, polit the political um, aspect of the decision that Marshall made. It's a, it's a good question and it's a hard one to answer because the evidence here is really murky. There's a lot of testimony, but it goes in a lot of different directions and there isn't like a document, one document that says, look, we're trying to take over the country. And one of the main witnesses in this trial was James Wilkinson, who was a, a general in the uh, U.S. Army who um, was collaborating with Burr for a while and then decided to rat him out. And who we also discovered uh, many years later was a spy for the Spanish government at the same time he was a US general. I've written about Wilkinson a little bit. He's probably the absolute worst human being to ever be a general in the United States Army, corrupt to the core. Um, so there's a lot of murky evidence, but I have a feeling that John Marshall would have found a way to find for Aaron Burr no matter what, because, you know, Marshall was appointed before Jefferson became president. They were, I mean, they were mortal enemies. They believed in very different things. They believed um, that the, each believed that the other was not only uh, in opposition, but was a, a sort of a terrible public figure. And uh, so I think there was a lot of politics in that decision. You know, it's, it's, um, it's easy to think back and think that everybody in the, in the early days of the country was you know, moved only by the purest of impulses to create a new nation. But the truth is that as soon as we get off the ground, people are arguing and fighting and trying to grab theirs. And there's a lot of that. And, and I always say that when I look at the, um, the sort of the fractious nature of, of things in colonial and post-colonial America and the fact that these were really flawed human beings, it always gives me great hope for the present because they weren't demigods. They didn't come down deus ex machina. They were just sometimes smart people, sometimes not so smart people, sometimes slightly corrupt people uh, you know, with a balancing different things. And they still somehow managed to create the foundations of this great experiment in democracy that we call the United States of America. Thank you for that. So we were speaking earlier about the, their legacy in New York, both Burr and Hamilton. Um, so Hamilton, just take us through it. So the New York Post was created by Alexander Hamilton? Hamilton founded the paper that is now the New York Post and hired uh, the first editor for. He also founded a bank that is now BNY Mellon. Um, and Aaron Burr founded a bank. Aaron Burr did it in a sneaky way. So if you're looking for some negative evidence about Aaron Burr, there was a, a yellow fever epidemic uh, in New York. And Aaron Burr said, I'm going to create a water company. It's going to bring in fresh water and we're going to raise a lot of capital. He even got Alexander Hamilton to support him in this effort. And then uh, they'd written into their charter of this company that they could do kind of, they could also engage in other businesses. And he drove a bulldozer through that loophole and kind of forgot about the water company and created a bank that uh, it started out as the Manhattan Company, but it's now Chase Manhattan Bank. Um, and, um, you know, at that time, I mean, that was like the third bank in New York. The thing is that banks were very political in those days. You know, sometimes a federalist bank isn't going to loan money to people who are uh, in the opposition party. There was a lot of suspicion even then that, that bankers were terribly corrupt and, uh, and sort of uh, speculative. And so uh, Burr, you know, some people say, oh, Bird used this to make money. Yeah, he probably did. Some people at the time thought, well, oh, Bird, this is a, a, something in his favor because he's now giving us a bank so we don't have to go to the evil bank of Hamilton and those Federalists. So, uh, and the pistols, this is not one of the dueling pistols. The dueling pistols are actually at Chase Manhattan. They are in a display case, not open to the public, even in normal times, it's uh, upstairs uh, at Chase Manhattan. Uh, and so they are still there and preserved. Wonderful. We, when the pandemic lifts, we'll go visit it. Right. Um, I, yes, I think it would be a great thing to do. Let's all go. Let's I think all we should go. go. <laughs> so I'll we lead the way. 
That would be great. <laughs> we have a question from Scott. Why do you think Hamilton was never truly thankful to Burr despite the fact that he was saved by him at least twice? Well, um, one example is the one I just gave. So the way the timing works, Hamilton and Burr have had their rapprochement and Hamilton is starting to think more highly of Burr and then Burr pulls this fast one and he creates the water company, but then they really fall down on the job of bringing the water in. They put in wooden pipes that don't work very well and, and they're starting a bank and Hamilton feels he's been had. And I think that that's why he's not um, grateful. It, that's for kind of the, the second time. The, the first time, I'm not sure Hamilton was how aware he was. You know, Hamilton was a lieutenant under uh, Colonel uh, Gold Silman. Um, he, he never talked about that. He talked about being in that unit, being one of the last people out of the city. He never talked about Burr's involvement. So he may have not really, really put that together or really uh, thought of it that way. But um, I think basically because any time that Burr started, Hamilton started to feel that, that Burr was on the up and up, Burr did something that convinced him he wasn't. And, you know, I, I want to just say, this is not a question that was asked, but um, Burr fought a duel a, a few years before um, uh, with uh, John Barker Church, who was um, Hamilton's brother-in-law. He's Angelica's husband, um, unmentioned in the Broadway play. And, uh, and they were both board members of this bank. And, um, and, and uh, Burr was unhappy that Church had said something about, uh, you know, about the, uh, the bank and the water company and what had been done. And so they go over to the same dueling ground um, and, uh, and they stand there 30 feet apart and they fire at each other and miss. And then they go, okay, that's done. We've, uh, we've uh, you know, honor has been served and now we'll go back to New York. And they chatted on their way in the boat back to New York. So there was a, a very uh, sort of specific intense set of feelings between Burr and Hamilton that didn't necessarily exist between Burr and other people or Hamilton and other people. So as you know, I work at a genealogical organization who are sponsoring this event with the BPL. And of course, we all have lots of um, genealogical questions. And the one, the DNA question that's come up from Pam, thank you, Pam, is uh -oh. um, do, you, do we think there's been any DNA study of Alexander Hamilton and his relatives to sort of look at his origins, uh, which is, we're so interesting, him coming from Nevis and any intelligence you have on that front? Not much. I mean, I, I uh, there is there has been some speculation that he has a Jewish ancestor, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, the evidence is, um, you know, it's it's I don't know it in detail, and uh, my impression is that it's not entirely convincing and it's not entirely unconvincing. Um, you know, through his his father. Um, he presumably would have uh, been descended from the, uh, uh, the Scottish family that his father came from. But there's a wrinkle there too, because, um, and the name's going to escape me, but he becomes, uh, he's taken in by another family at one point after his mother has died. Uh, and this merchant who hires him, and there's some speculation that it's possible that this man was his actual father, uh, and that that's why he was... Um, close to, to Hamilton. Although Hamilton did maintain a relationship, uh, or at least an, not a relationship, but an interest in his father until he died. What, what I think is interesting is um, the possibility of descendants from Aaron Burr. Now, um, Burr's wife, um, uh, Theodosia, they married and they had a daughter, Theodosia, and she died and didn't have any children. So one would say, well, he must not have any descendants. Although it turns out that you can impregnate people without being married to them. And so um, I know headline news. Okay. So, um, and I know there are uh, people who uh, believe that they may be uh, descended from Aaron Burr uh, and possibly that some of these may be relationships that he had with, um, uh, you know, very sad to say in this time that relationships that he might've had with servants 
uh, who worked with him. But he was, whereas Hamilton had a reputation for being a um, sort of a jumping from bed to bed person. I don't think he was. I think he probably had very few affairs. It's just that it's were very public. Burr, uh, the evidence seems to be the opposite. He had many, many paramours uh, and his biographer after Burr died and Burr saved all their letters, his biographer burned them all uh, to uh, hopefully to avoid them staining his reputation. So that's the area that I'd be interested to find out more about. Thank you. Very interesting. So get on that, would you? Check yeah, that out. I'm gonna write tonight. Yeah. <laughs> So I think we have time for a couple more questions. And one that a lot of people are probably thinking about is how accurate is the history in the musical and the, the musical that's gonna be coming out in a couple of weeks? What's sort of, I know that's sort of a more general question, but how, how would you describe the accuracy of it? Of that? Well, I would say, first of all, that, um, you know, it, it it's a show, so things are, are changed and shortened and dramatized, but I have never been to another play that had so much real history in it. Um, in the play, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton meet a lot more often and are a lot more connected at different points in their careers than they really were. And uh, the play also posits that Aaron Burr is this sort of wiser, older man, whereas I think he probably was actually younger than Hamilton, or they're very close in age to each other. Uh, and there's times when, for example, there's a duel uh, that is fought between Hamilton's friend, uh, John Lawrence and um, uh, General Lee um, uh, after the Battle of Monmouth. And they've got in the play, they've got Burr being Lee's second, when in fact Burr was not Lee's second. So you have uh, a number of kind of places where the, the author of the play has adjusted history to fit the dynamic. But I think in general, it gives you a really good idea of the dynamic of the time. And I always say, look, it's a musical. Thomas Jefferson didn't sing at cabinet meetings, okay? So we know that's not true. We're not holding it to that expectation. I'd say it's, it's as accurate, probably a lot more accurate than let's say Henry V or Julius Caesar or plays like that. Um, and it is filled with history and I would highly recommend it. Even listening to the soundtrack, you can learn a lot of history. You just have to then, you know, kind of find another source to sort of tell you, uh, fill it in for you. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? I mean, I can go through the whole play if we have time, <laughs> uh, scene by scene right now, song by song, but I thought maybe you didn't want to do that. That was great, thank you. I, thank you. So I have a last question because we're approaching the hour mark. Uh, and it, and actually a number of people have also um, asked this question concerning their character. Um, these two gentlemen, they're sort of um, moral compasses, both of them. And I think it's fascinating that Aaron Burr is descendant from Jonathan Edwards, you know, that amazing preacher. Um, were either of these gentlemen religious? Uh, did, was it the common that they all went to church in that era? Or did anyone strike you as more moral or less moral? I mean, Hamilton clearly impassioned by the need to set government right and do it right. And, you know, a religious, you use the word calling to sort of, you know, expunge Burr. But, you know, where do, where do these guys stand on the morality count and the religious count? Wow, you saved a very complex question for the end. Um, you can cliff note it if you want. Neither, yeah, yeah, yeah. check out my blog tomorrow. Uh, neither of them was particularly religious. In fact, there was an issue that uh, Hamilton almost couldn't be buried in the church because he hadn't been attending, mm -hmm. uh, but they, they arm twisted the bishop. Um, and I would say that, um, that in terms of moral compass, I mean, I, the easy answer is to say that Hamilton's was a stronger moral compass, but I'm not sure that's exactly true. You know, Hamilton strayed with his uh, relationship uh, from his wife. He, um, um, he had fixed principles, but he wasn't above, um, obviously, a, a dalliance like that. I think that I think that if you look at the long arc of Burr's life, he clearly, his moral compass deserts him. And the question is kind of where does it desert him? Does it, is, is he always a bad guy? Or, you know, 
I mean, if you look at somebody like Benedict Arnold, he was an amazing hero for America. And then he got angry and got, um, you know, sort of feeling that he was not being given his due and he kind of switched sides. And I think of Burr more that way, that he's somebody who had a lot going for him, but he got kind of caught up in this thing with Hamilton and that's so twisted things that then he just said, well, fine, if you guys are gonna consider me an outcast, I'm gonna act like an outcast and, uh, and go in that direction. So um, I, I, you know, in the end, I'm not exactly gonna answer the question, but I think that uh, they both had some moral failings. Burr had more as time went by, but it's hard to compare where Hamilton would have been as time he went by. lived longer, right? Yeah. You can get yeah. into more trouble the longer you live. Well, sure. And I mean, I do think that, that in the end, uh, he was more about number one than he was about the country. He was more about himself than he was about the country, about any issues. And ultimately, I guess that is going to count against you in the subject of moral compass. Thank you so much. That was so interesting. And um, that, that is our last question. Everyone hang on, because we have a couple more things to accomplish here. But um, Rick, what a pleasure. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. Yeah. Kristen, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you, Rick. Um, to get a copy of Rivals Unto Death, um, please visit our partner for this talk, Quarter Square Books. Give them the code there, and they will ship the book for you. And I believe they are signed. And also, if you, with your public library card, whether it's a Boston Public Library card or your local public library, you might want to borrow Rick's books and films at your li local library. I know the Boston Public Library has some of his um, works in our collection, so um, you can do that as well. So thank you, Rick. Thank you, Margaret and NEHGS. Um, and I'd like to give a special thanks to the Boston Public Library's AV team, Amanda and Jay, who are here with us tonight, who are helping us out with the tech. So thank you all. And Margaret, over to you. It was a pleasure as always, and we'll see you next time. Yes, and thank you, Kristen. And while our research um, library and uh, research center on Newbury Street is closed to the public, we at American Ancestors have much to offer you um, in this at-home time. If you're looking for other enlightening activities, enjoy our video archive of author talks at AmericanAncestors.org slash inspire. You can engage in American Ancestors educational programs online or in person. See the full rundown at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. Um, there are many free webinars there about how best to do research of history, research of your family, wherever they came from. And if you have questions, um, we have free chats. Um, you want to learn about a certain immigrant ship or a section of a Massachusetts cemetery, chat with one of our genealogists at AmericanAncestors.org slash chat. Um, at, our, at American Ancestors NEHGS, our mission is to educate, inspire, and connect. We love stories of all sorts, particularly Rick's tonight. Um, for many of us there, books and authors are our very special treat. So with the Boston Public Library, we'll be doing more of these virtual author talks for your enjoyment, for ours, and for the stake of keeping arts and culture alive. On Thursday, July 23rd, we'll be joined by the celebrated author and former Globe reporter, Larry Tai, with his latest book, Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. This event will be presented in partnership with the Boston Public Library's new series on politics, The Arc of History, Contested Perspectives. On August 11th, we're welcoming author Gretchen Sorin of the Cooperstown Graduate Program with her, gra with her celebrated new work, Driving While Black, African-American Travel and the Road to Civil Rights. This is really a remarkable work of history on the role of the automobile in the advancement of civil rights. It's not to be missed. Uh, registration is open for that at AmericanAncestors.org slash inspire and save the date for another Arc of History and American Inspiration author event. On Thursday, August 20th, Susan Eisenhower will talk about her grandfather, President Dwight D. Eisenhower, and her book, her new book, How Ike Led. For now, though, we wish all of you out there a wonderful and inspirational evening and a safe and celebratory July 4th holiday. We will hope to see you on July 23rd. Good night from American Ancestors and good night also from the Boston Public Library. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>